There we go. There we go. Thank you, gentlemen. All right. Whew. Step one accomplished. Got, got slides to, to, to display. So throughout my career, I've done a lot of red teaming. I'm a former red teamer, former pen tester. Um, I've done everything from you know, your standard phishing, vishing, uh, to physical security assessments. At one point, um, a team I was a part of, we recreated the original Trojan horse and we FedExed a person, a fellow pen tester, inside a facility. Um, he did make it through security, popped out, and uh, he did not do as the original Trojan horse folks did and slay a bunch of people. Uh, but he did let us in and he also, you know, dropped USBs and plugged in things everywhere he could. Um, and as part, of, as part of a lot of that work, I've also read a lot of reports that have come out of social engineering assessments. And one thing that's really stuck out, uh, stuck out to me, both from actually doing the work and my own report writing to reading a lot of reports, has been that there's a huge emphasis on fixing or training the human layer of this you know, revised OSI stack that we're all working with. And by fixing or training, we really mean making non-security personnel, and even security personnel in some cases, think more like security people, look at the world through a security lens. And one of the things that I've really struggled with now that I've moved away from the consulting assessment side of things and actually owning a security program is that it doesn't actually work in practice how we, we would like it to. And so I, this talk is a summary of things I've been experimenting, ideas I've been tinkering with for a while, and how I think we can challenge ourselves, both in how we test, what we look at, what we talk about, to make social engineering remediation really scale. So really quickly, here is the agenda that we're gonna cover today. So we're gonna, step one, really quickly focus on or touch on the state of social engineering today, the widening gap that's occurring, or that, that is happening. Um, start to look at themes. This is where we'll inject the, uh, the co central concept or uh, premise of the talk. And then talk about putting all of those ideas into practice, um, both as a tester and as a practitioner owning a program. And so before I go any further, um, this is me in a nutshell. I'm DC based. I run the trust and security team at a company called Nuna. We're a healthcare uh, analytics company based out of San Francisco. Not really important to all of this, just in to say that because we are a healthcare company, we see a lot of crazy stuff come at us in the form of social engineering attacks. Uh, you know, we've seen the spoofed emails, we've seen compromised emails then being used, to, used against us. We've had all the, the whaling and the, the financial based attacks coming after all of our funding. Uh, things like that. When I was, uh, I consulted for the beginning part of my career, most recently at a company called Sigital, if anyone's familiar with it. And there I ran Red Team Operations and the uh, Red Team Services. And I am, as Kaz mentioned, a huge Batman fan. This is me. I do own a full Batman suit in addition to tattoos and everything. Only one of these was actually on Halloween. Um, <laughs> so why not? Um, all right. So, this is the typical situation. Company is trying to you know, bolster its security posture. It engages some kind of uh, third party security firm. They come in, they do some testing, social engineering testing. Uh, maybe it's directed at social engineering or maybe it's just part of a broader scope. And through that social engineering testing, lo and behold, they find that people are clicking on links, they're giving up credentials, they're, they're giving up sensitive information in some form or fashion, or they're giving up a foothold. And when they call them up on the phone, as we saw a little bit during the, uh, the SE competition here, people give up information when they're, uh, when they're sweet talked a little bit, or if um, there isn't something stopping them from giving up that information. Very, very basic. And what that ends up leading to is a report that focuses probably pretty, uh, pretty squarely on awareness training. So we need to start looking at training those people to not click on links, to not give up their passwords to, uh, to websites, things like that. And we've gotten really, really creative around how we, how we educate people through games, through uh, video content, through little social nudges. At uh, Nuna, we run a, this thing called, or this little program uh, we call the, the Human Firewall Award. And on a monthly basis, we have this really cheesy little Grammy style trophy that says human, uh, Nuna Human Firewall on it. We give it to somebody on a monthly basis to kind of celebrate the fact that they, uh, they were the, 
the best fishing report for that, uh, for that month, or they caught the craziest thing for that month. Um, so there's a lot of ways that we can bolster awareness. But it's expensive. Um, a lot of it is anyways. It's expensive in terms of people's time and investment relative to the return on investment that you end up getting in terms of everything that they take away from the training and apply on a day in day out basis. And then what a lot of these social engineering assessments end up pointing to, uh, or at least some that I've read in my, in my role now, is that people are constantly clicking on things, they're constantly falling for stuff, and because of that we have to assume that we're all breached already, everything is already over, and so instead we have to shift to, you know, prevention is dead, we have to focus on detect faster, respond better. Um, I don't actually believe that's true for anyone that does, I'm sorry. Um, we can duke it out after this. Um, let me have my moment of fame here. So um, during that tooling arms race, you end up with more and more tools in the form of capabilities being injected into a program. And all of those come with increased costs and we're kind of shooting blind. Um, we're stumbling through the woods in the dark, bumping into trees, and every time we come up against a tree, we, have, we introduce a new tool, cut it down, get it out of our way. And thanks to DBIR and their fantastic, Verizon's DBIR that is, and their fantastic graphing skills, making things that are really easy to understand, um, we have this graph right here, which is a little bit of an eyesore, but what I want people to focus on is this little tiny middle section here, these, the yellow and green lines. And what those, uh, what those lines tell us on this graph is that over the last six years or so, you see social engineering vet vectors and malware-based vectors having an increasingly uh, prevalent, uh, or attackers are using them more and more and more as a foothold into a data breach of some form. Um, they are the initial cause of, um, cause of exploitation or cause of breach. So if we're spending more money on all of these things, yet they continue to go up, something is not actually working. We need to rethink the way that we are actually doing our testing or the way that we're approaching remediation because we know we can find this stuff. Um, we know we're very good at that. Um, but we clearly are not very good at actually getting our point across at scale. Um, in, in program environments where you know, we have a lot of metrics, we have very frequent touch points, you can absolutely see um, you know, people's susceptibility trending downwards and that's amazing, but I don't think that that's actually working fast enough or broadly enough in order to really truly make a difference at scale. Um, it's definitely, it definitely helps and we should continue doing it, but um, I think we need to do even more. So, the status quo, so right now, we're investing in training, we're investing in uh, you know, bolstering that, that individual or that team of individuals' awareness about uh, social engineering attacks. And as a, as a CISO or a, you know, peop, somebody leading a security program, I have to ask myself a few key questions, um, such as what happens when that person who I've invested all of this time in leaves the company? They take that investment with them. Uh, they no longer are contributing to our resilient security posture. Um, plus, I don't know how, how uh, this applies to any of you, but any training that you've gone through on day one or um, you know, your annual security training or any annual training, I don't know how much of that you actually remember. Um, outside of the security stuff, because me being a security person, I don't really remember much of it. And I know this is, this is true for a lot of folks. And then bigger than that, how do people behave under stress, especially when they're in a role that's geared around helping people that are interacting with them? IT help desk, uh, people on uh, like, a pass like a customer service role, things like that. They are incentivized and there are metrics behind how they are able to assist, not necessarily how secure they are, which is another, uh, another slight issue. So this graph, a little bit easier to understand, this came out of some research that was done on retention rates in enterprise training, not necessarily for security specifically, but training programs in general. And what this graph tells us is that there is a huge drop off on the amount of information that's retained and the days after the training um, that the, the individual retains that information. And really effective awareness programs are attempting to shift that line up and to the right. But unless we can get that, uh, that line to just be straight across indefinitely, then there's always going to be a gap. Everything over here 
is where adversaries are going to take advantage of an opening and continue to leverage those openings to get into our environments. And so you can liken this to trying to hunt grizzly bears with birdshot. You're likely to just make a small impact. It's not going to be complete. You might have to hit them a million times before they bleed out and you can actually win that, that particular uh, interaction. I don't know about you, but I would not want to hunt or come up against a grizzly with nothing but birdshot. Um, and one of the things that, that is interesting about security, not um, you know, outside of a lot of enterprise training programs, is that our field is evolving so, so quickly. And so there's always more things that we're trying to pile onto the awareness training plate. And if we're always piling more stuff on and they're not retaining the stuff that, we, uh, that we're already trying to emphasize, then it's just going to get harder and harder and harder and harder. And then one thing that I've really challenged myself on is why is it that we as security professionals, we are expecting other people to think like us, but we are not stopping to think about how they actually go through a system or interact with a process or a technology, things like that. So we have to, we have to put on their user experience hat and try to think like them and build better things. And so that is ultimately the core of the theme-based approach that I'm going to talk through today. So there's a few, th uh, few things that I want people to, that I hope people can accept, it, not necessarily as absolutes, but as probable things uh, going through this. So the first being, people are always going to be vulnerable as long as they're making a decision in some context. As long as there is a discretionary series of actions that occur, people are susceptible to potentially making the wrong one, especially when they're coerced in a certain direction. Um, coerced towards, you know, maybe they're uh, receiving a phone call from somebody claiming to be an executive director and that person needs their password reset because they're about to go into a critical meeting. You know, that person is likely to fall, fall for that attack and give up the password or reset the password for the individual. The second is the person is not necessarily to blame. However, the role that they are playing in the organization is to blame. You could liken this to um, like child product safety uh, rules or uh, product safety uh, features for uh, to protect children from you know pulling a thing up like pulling a pill top off and swallowing a bunch of pills or um, screwing up a, uh, with a toy or something and hurting themselves. We're designing roles where people are susceptible and able to actually blow their own foot off and make a mistake. And then third is that training is not going to stick 100% of the time for 100% of the days in which they are operating in that role. There's always going to be a little bit of a gap no matter how good that we are at training. And um, you know, for anyone who's familiar with the, the security engineering space where we're trying to train developers up and get them to you know, know about things like cross-site scripting and SQL injection, we've seen this a million times over where you know, we're expecting them to keep up on all of the things that we talk about at security conferences like this, but at the same time, they have to keep up with all of the things that make them good at their jobs, put all that together, and apply it on a day-in, day-out basis. And it's a lot to remember. So if, we don't, if they don't have guardrails in the form of security controls, it's easier to make mistakes. So I want to I wanna describe or walk through this process in the form of an attack tree, a very simple uh, easy to understand attack tree. And consider that an attacker wants to start by uh, taking over an account in some capacity. They might brute force credentials, they might choose to go down the phishing route, probably a little bit easier. If they go down the phishing route, they may have a few options available to them. They might want to steal credentials, um, they might want to achieve some kind of RCE um, with that user, whether it's uh, an attachment, um, a nefarious attachment of sorts. A, maybe it's a, a link that they browse to that then allows them to, like a beef, uh, beef infected web page. Or maybe they just uh, lead them to a page that is spoofed in some form or fashion and get them to give up their credentials. And then from there, they can do other things. Maybe they can replay those credentials, maybe they can pivot, maybe they can dig in like bed bugs into your environment. Whatever it happens to be, they have some foothold at that point. Pretty easy to understand. So. You might ask yourself, thinking through this very, very simple attack tree, a few things, and this is where we start to get into the themes, is why in the first place are credentials able to be replayed? Can we find a way to prevent that malicious code from actually running? Is there a way that we can stop that content from hitting the inbox in the first place 
Or if they send that to maybe 15 people and it's detected once, can we really, really quickly respond and remove it from the other 14 recipients? Find, find who has received it, remove it before the impact gets even worse and you have some kind of epidemic on your hands. So those are the kind of questions that we're going to start to tease out as part of, these, uh, as part of this theme-based approach. And what I want to focus here on is systemic defenses. So finding ways that within an attack tree, we can inject control or detection and response capabilities into that flow. And by doing that, we can find ways to break out training instead of having um, like one time coming at you training sessions to break up training into smaller social nudges or smaller technology based nudges into that same workflow. So that way the user is getting smaller, more efficient and effective bits and bits and bytes of training and, uh, and hopefully allowing them to kind of interrupt their workflow, think about something and then move on. And you could, this is not a perfect example, but it's, it's an example nonetheless. Uh, you can think about Google Chrome's um, user experience around uh, insecure websites, potentially malicious websites. Um, if you browse to something that's not using the HSTS header, let's say, they don't allow you to go to it. You know, you'll get the certificate warning, it'll, it'll prevent, present you with some educational information, and it doesn't allow you to go further. If that site is a little bit better, they're using that, but their, their certs are out of date or something like that, it's self-signed, you'll still get the same interrupt in uh, user experience. They'll try to educate you about something and, and then let you proceed if you decide to click through. Um, and it gets a little bit less egregious the better the site is in, uh, the better state that the site is in. So maybe it's just a little um, you know, red lock or something or you know, it's missing a lock in the, in the browser bar, something to that effect. All right, and that's the big thing here, is finding ways to use control within a workflow to make things more effective so you can achieve benefits of scale. And so thinking about this, uh, we'll do an attack and defense tree in that same very, very simple attack tree. We're gonna go with the same attack methods here. So if I wanted to lop that brute force credentials uh, path off of the attack tree, I might use very simple controls like lock them, locking them out or multi-factor authentication. This has all been done, great. We've kind of stopped that or made that much more difficult. If I wanna start to make phishing a little bit harder, I might have a layer in there where I narrow the attack surface a little bit um, through some specifically placed controls using things like DMARC or DKIM or uh, better spam filtering, something like that. And we can keep moving on through. And maybe we have another layer um, relative to where the attacker is at in that stage. You can use things like application whitelisting or browser plugins or something that you roll out across the enterprise. These are things that you could do on an enterprise ready basis. And then moving on through to the end of the attack tree, there's more stuff that you can layer in. And ultimately, what we're trying to do here is either make it harder to traverse a particular attack tree or a path down an attack tree, or find ways that you can remove branches of that tree altogether. And if you can remove branches of that tree, then you can narrow the amount of uh, the, the scope and the focus of that particular training. And ultimately, the user's focus, they have to remember a little bit less and so your retention rate might be a little bit uh, better. Or maybe you just make it a little bit harder for that particular uh, capability to, or that particular path to be, uh, to be executed against. And ultimately, if you have confidence as somebody managing uh, these controls at an enterprise scale, if you have confidence in the controls that you're layering out here, then you can start to figure out where you might want to put your training. Like for instance, if you're taking advantage of that uh, application whitelisting, like on the left side of this particular attack tree, and the right side is a little bit more on the atrocious side, then maybe you focus your training over there on where exactly people are giving up their credentials, something like that. All right. So now, switching gears into putting all of this stuff into practice. First things first is you have to be mindful of the user experience. If you create or inject a lot of high friction touch points or gates that the people, that, the, that your user base has to, uh, you know, kind of jump over, then ultimately they're probably going to find ways to route around you or they're just going to be in a perpetual state of being pissed off at your security team. Or if you're a tester and you're recommending things that are very, very high friction or take a lot of time, 
then you're going to be putting your client in a potentially bad position where they're going to be the ones who are, uh, whose users are pissed off at them. So be very mindful of the user experience when you're making these kind of recommendations. And the second thing is your particular context is absolutely paramount to consider. So you know, we could sit up here and talk around like how you create a secure help desk workflow, um, how you prevent against, um, uh, prevent against password reset uh, processes from being abused, things like that. But every, every enterprise or every organization is going to have a unique way of doing this, very likely. And so you have to be willing to break down these particular workflows for your organization and look at how, how an attacker is going to step through them within your org, within your context, within your process, your technology, things like that. All right. So as a tester, um, we'll focus on this from a few different perspectives. First being from the, that tester consultant uh, perspective. So we mentioned this at the beginning, but a lot of times when we find those issues, we find that people are clicking on links, people are downloading attachments and running them, people are doing any number of things that are ultimately going to degrade the resiliency or the security posture of that organization. We recommend controls that focus on the human layer. We recommend that they, you know, go through that training, go through that, um, you know, go through, you know, uh, like recertification or whatever, whatever the process is. And instead, I want to challenge folks to break down, uh, think about issues from a root cause analysis perspective. And think about within the, the context of whatever it is you found, what is the root cause that actually led to that human being able to do what they did? Um, whether it's give up, give up credentials, um, you know, whether it's give up sensitive information, um, you know, open an attachment, give up credentials on a web page, whatever it happens to be, what is it that allowed them to do that? And make your recommendations center around those things. They're much more tangible, much more, uh, much more appropriate at scale. And so you, can, you could consider this from, uh, from the perspective of going through a few sample uh, social engineering engagements. Um, so these are all real. Um, I have lived and breathed these myself, but let's say you're doing a physical security assessment and you walk in, you, uh, you sweet talk some people, and you get them to plug something in, and it, you get it to run uh, you know, a sample benign application, and then you come back and you say, well, I was, able to, uh, I was able to launch that application, that benign application, therefore I could launch something much more nefarious. Finding, um, you, know, you write it up, Winning as social engineering. So, in this particular context, you might report it as, um, you know, why in the world was a USB device able to get um, plugged in in the first place? In this particular context, I was in a bank, um, posing as IT, like IT audit support. And in a bank, you know, I've been in banking environments where sometimes they don't even allow USB drives, especially not, you know, just like why was um, why was there not a call up to um, you know, to whoever I said I was there working with to validate my identity um, before I was able to proceed anywhere. Um, there's a few process or technical things that you could do first to make this a little bit harder. So this is another one. This was also with a bank that I worked with. Um, doing a vishing test of a call center. Um, get some, uh, some background noise playing like airport or something like that. Say you're, you know, high ranking executive so and so. You're trying, to, um, you're trying to reset your password, get onto the VPN, whatever it is, and you're, having, you're running into issues. You've done your research, you, you know, know about uh, some of the, you know about the, the individual you're impersonating's background information that is likely to be used for security questions, et cetera, et cetera. You get somebody on the phone, because it is a call center, they're there to help you, and you start sweet talking. You start using vague responses like, well, you know, I, I, don't know, I don't remember exactly what answer I used in the what street did you grow up on. You know, I was trying to throw people off. You know, maybe I, maybe I used this one, maybe I used that one, um, something like that. And if a call, if a call center, um, pers the person working at the call center, if they can see those answers, they're much more likely or that it is possible that they could make a decision in that sequence of actions to let you have it, to take it easy on you that day because you're going through a bad day, they are incentivized to help you. Versus something where they have to enter the information you provide them. 
you, they enter it into a system, it comes back and says it's right or it's wrong, it allows them to proceed, something like that. Almost an invisible uh, introduction and workflow for something that cannot be gamed necessarily, cannot be sweet talked or smooth talked. Um, you know, you could you can inject a lockout on that person's account through that same um, through that same process. You could have escalation points in place, things like that. So, when you're writing those reports, um, again, you have to focus on, or I would challenge folks to focus on the underlying set of circumstances, be it technology issues, process issues, whatever, um, that allowed that thing to happen. And instead propose technology, process, human-oriented system components that could prevent or make that a little bit harder to carry out in the future. Um, yeah, so a lot of, I won't, I won't read through all of those things, but it's basically drill down to the root cause, recommend around that. So thinking about tooling, so as, uh, as if you're working on the practitioner, the practitioner side, um, you know, there's a lot of, you'll, and you come to a conference like this, you'll have a lot of people begging you to spend money with them. Um, there's a lot of tools out there, if anyone's ever traversed the, uh, the RSA or Black Hat Expo floors, um, there's a lot of things going on, and those vendors will, of course, tell you that they have the perfect solution to all of your problems. They have your silver bullet in mind. So if you were to start, if you were to take that same attack tree, attack and defense tree approach, where you're layering controls um, within a particular workflow that might be social engineering relevant, um, what you can do from a, uh, from a tooling perspective is figure out, all right, vendor A is coming to me. They are providing me this particular capability. It fits exactly within my attack tree in this way. And ultimately, this will help you reduce some of that vendor FUD. Um, it'll help you figure out exactly where it's protecting you, where it's not protecting you. And you can figure out, you can kind of bucket it into these control detect response um, categories. Maybe you don't want a program that's solely um, or very heavily geared towards detection and response. Because detection is always going to get harder, response is always going to get harder, and that almost inherently puts you in a position where you're fighting a widening gap. Um, whereas prevention can help you keep that gap, keep the possibility of the gap narrow to begin with. All right. So, focusing on some next steps. Because I always like to end my presentations with some practical things that people can do. So, first things first, I would say figure out what your particular context is. Figure out what social engineering scenarios are most relevant to you. Maybe it's, maybe you're very concerned about phishing. Maybe you're very concerned about uh, the types of scenarios that we were uh, stress testing in the competition leading up to this. The vishing, the uh, calls against help desks, uh, calls against um, employee directories, things to that effect. Figure out whatever it is that's important to you. Build an attack tree against that particular scenario at first. Don't try to do it for every single thing that's in your organization. You'll be overwhelmed, you won't know where to start, and really trying to solve every single problem at once is just, you know, you're gonna be fraught with disaster. So if Rome wasn't built in a day, complete uh, security postures are not also built in a day. So pick one, dive into it, analyze it, break it down. And within that attack and defense tree, figure out where you can potentially introduce improvements through that, through that workflow in technology, process, or new systems, and figure out where you can start to layer them. You don't have to, again, solve an entire attack tree at once. You can make small iterative improvements. If one particular branch through that tree looks like it is, or based on your historical data, is very likely to get taken advantage of, or you know, you know it's been taken advantage of zillions of times in the past, then focus there first. Try to make that a little bit better. And then maybe you shift over to something else that is higher priority. But find ways that you can exert the Pareto principle, the 80% you know, of the benefit for 20% of the cost or 20% of the investment onto that attack and defense tree. So you're making small investments for big gain and keep going through that process. And then ultimately, um, I would encourage folks to try out some kind of A-B testing. Try out some way to uh, experiment with this. So you're not always going to get it right. Sometimes you might screw up the user experience. And that's okay. You can always revert. No decisions have to be final uh, and permanent. But find ways that you can make small iterative improvements. Um, test them. If they don't work, change them. Um, but ultimately, the more and more you're, you're striving towards making these little dents in your security posture, little dents in your workflows, you're going to end up coming out on top. 
or at least in a much better position. So that is all the content I had. So I wanted to leave a little time for Q&A. So thank you very much. Um, and I will pause and uh, leave open for any questions. The, su the support metric that is. Yes. So I would. Uh, so the question was just to repeat for uh, for everyone: um, is how in a in a more technology focused approach, how do you get um, a a function, a business function like a customer support um, representative who is very heavily incentivized towards helping? How do you change the kind of flip the script on them to uh, to not impact the way that they're evaluated? Um, and still, and still tackle this. Um, so I would say there, you don't necessarily have to focus on a technology approach, but maybe it's a, a process focused, uh, or maybe you can change the KPI entirely. So if they're incentivized purely on how many people they help, and that's it, you know, there might be a, a more efficient way to, um, there might be a more efficient way to, uh, to write that KPI, and you know, maybe it's the amount of people that you help and, um, you know, let's say uh, like you you follow a validation process or something like that. Like the amount of times you've followed the exact process or not had to you know have an escalation or you know something like that. There might be ways to either change the KPI or there might be slight changes in process, like the way that they validate, the way that they the things that they check of the user, something like that, where you're still letting them do their job and you're incentivizing them to do their job. They just do it slightly differently. Um, because a lot of these things are just process issues. At least like that uh, the help desk issue that I that I cited. So I was going after and trying to get them to reset um, a VPN profile for this bank. And um, like literally, I just I provided a few phony answers on security questions. They let me onto the VPN, and like from there, it was all SSO driven. So I could I could get onto whatever that person had access to. And it's like you know if if a very small change in process would have would have stopped me from doing that. So, yeah. Cool. Any other questions? Yeah. Like keep it, keeping that line moving up and to the right as much as you. So. Because after a while, let me, let me it. Sure. After a while, sending a bunch of them just makes people not trust them. Or sending a bunch of phishing emails, you mean? Trust. Yep. Yep. And I don't know about you guys, but you know, if if my organization could basically not trust email, then that's really tough. A live fish. So, uh, yes. So that is true. And, and so the the comment up here was, uh, in this particular program, we didn't do a lot of retraining for those that fell for the attack. So the the way that we ended up approaching this um, is we do really frequent, um, and we you know we of course vary um, our social engineering tests, like phishing tests on a on a regular basis. And instead of forcing people into a negative situation where they have you know, a negative correlation with the experiences that they have. Um, so they fell for it, whatever. Like we'll actually reward some people if they fall for uh, the social engineering test. And every time that they fall for it, we have a very small, like, mini touch point in the form of like a retrospective um, on like how they fell for it, what they fell for, something like that. Instead of going through a you know big bolt-on um, awareness test, and depending on how they respond to that, they may end up they may end up being candidates for the like the human firewall award, and. Going through a, going through it like that, where we give them a positive association with interacting with our security team as well as receiving training, we found a lot better just retention rates as well as just.
people feel better about engaging with us. They feel better about reporting because there's no shame in doing so. Uh, things like that. So instead of thinking about it as training, we think about it you know, more as like these small little touch points and then we'll encourage them to, um, like a lot, I'm, I'm very big on trying to find proxies to go do my work for me because you know, I don't have the amount of resources to just go do everyone's jobs and like make everything secure. So if I can find somebody else to go you know, be a champion for me, be a proxy, then, then I'm, gonna go and do, I'm gonna go and do that and that'll also kind of boost their profile, it boosts my mission Things like that. So, yeah, yeah. So, um, just to like put a like fine point on the on the original question in terms of uh, like regular like trying to keep that line as high high up and as far right as possible. Um, you know, we we rely really heavily on very small touch points and as like using proxies as much as possible because if people are hearing it not from the security team, then you know they just have a better better experience and I found that like when people feel better about security they're they're ultimately just going like they're going to interact with us more and the more they interact with us the better we end up being like so yeah So the question, uh, just to repeat, was oftentimes C-suite people can be a little pushy. Um, I don't know if anyone has ever experienced a CEO who demands something immediately. Um, and they may look at the security team and say, you belong to me um, in some form or fashion. I control your budget, so make it so. Um, and try to bypass those, um, those processes that you're putting in place. Um, so one thing that we, uh, that we did is um, let's say for access control requests. Uh, we funnel everything through a Slack bot based access control request and response process. And the way that the process is set up is that even if we wanted to, there is no, you know, without a huge amount of pain in the ass and we don't advertise it, uh, there is no way to just manually bypass it through, you know, people shouting and crying and screaming and kicking on the floor and, you know, whatever else, whatever other tactics that may be resorted to. And so, you know, if we're not advertising any possible workaround and like basically the process is designed such that they have to funnel through it, then you know, we've seen a lot more luck with that. And, and if we make the process really frictionless, then they have a lot less problem going through it. Um, and so like it's not, it's not perfect. Um, of course, like in any ways you may still have a, um, you know, a potential back door around it or something. In that case, I might recommend that they get it, like if it's something really sensitive, like a, uh, like a CIO or a CTO or something demanding a, um, you know, access to Active Directory or something, you know, something to that effect, that there be a secondary sign-off at like a department head level or something like that, where there has to be an interaction. And like I've instructed my team that you know, for things like that, that they just cannot proceed without having some kind of, um, you know, some kind of documented sign-off where, um, you know, if somebody is being a bad actor or they're just being kind of pushy and trying to, like, get people to, to fall in line, that they still have to go have a conversation around it. And, like, they're not to, they're just not to proceed otherwise. Um, and the more that you can make that a technical control, for instance, with, like, um, you know, engineering guardrails, um, like, you can't land code in master unless it check, like, passes all tests. Like, the, finding the equivalence of that through these kind of workflows the more you can do that where it's just impossible to, to bypass, the better position to be in. So. Cool. Any other questions? All right. Well, excellent. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>